let's take a look at more interference phenomena. And to start with, let's remind ourselves of two-slit interference and single-slit diffraction. So two-slit interference is created when waves pass through two slits, and then we get a projection on a screen over to the side. And when that happens, we get a series of bright and dark fringes on the screen. Um, the location of the bright fringes can be found using an equation, s is equal to n lambda d over d. That gives us the location of the nth bright fringe, where the central bright fringe is n equals 0, the next one out is n equals 1, and so on and so on. Lambda is the wavelength, d is the distance between the slits and the screen, and small d is the distance between the two slits. And each fringe is a certain distance away from the next bright fringe. And that distance is given by s is equal to lambda d over d. For single slit diffraction, we have light passing through a single aperture, and then it projects on a screen over here. And when we do that, it creates a pattern with a large central maximum, and then smaller light dark fringes on the outside. And we have an equation, theta is equal to lambda over a, that tells us the angle to the first dark spot, to the first minimum. And A is the width of the aperture in that equation. Now, in reality, when you actually do a double slit experiment, when you send light through two slits, it's going through two individual slits. So in reality, something that we've ignored is that when the light passes through one of the slits, each slit is going to create its own diffraction pattern. So, in reality, when we send light through double slits, the observed pattern will be a combination of single slit diffraction and two slit interference. And let me show you what, what I mean by that. So, we have a pattern of single slit diffraction, and that's created just because light is passing through two apertures, each an individual aperture, so each one will create a single slit diffraction pattern. But we also have the two slit interference pattern, which will be created because the light will interfere. The light from each slit will interfere with the other one. So the observed pattern, the actual pattern that we would see on a screen is a combination of those two. And it looks like this. The vocabulary that we use is that we say that the observed pattern is a double slit pattern modulated by a single slit pattern. And it looks like that. So it's kind of the double slit interference pattern under an envelope of the single slit diffraction. That's often another way that it's been it's said. It's under the envelope of the single slit pattern. Now let's do a little thought experiment about what would happen if you increased the number of slits. So it's no longer two slits that light is passing through, but many, many slits that light is passing through. And we'll think about what the implications are for a point over here on the screen. And let's imagine, okay, we have light that is diffracted from one of the slits and it passes from one of the slits over to this screen. Well, well, if the light from this slit reaches the screen over here, now it's much more likely that somewhere among those many, many slits, there's another slit which will destructively interfere with the incoming light. Because there are many, many slits, for every point on the screen, it's now more likely that there's another point or another slit that's going to be sending out light which will destructively interfere at the screen. So, you will have more points on the screen which are destructively interfering and more of the screen will be dark. That's the rough argument here. So as the number of slits increases, the points on the screen where waves destructively interfere become more common. We get larger dark regions on the screen and fewer bright regions on the screen. So I'm going to try to draw some rough uh, diagrams here. So I'll start with the expected two slit pattern. Remember, it's the double slit pattern that's modulated by a single slit pattern. And if we had four slits, well, we'd expect wider dark regions and narrower or smaller or sharper 
bright fringes. And then if we had many, many slits that light is passing through, we would expect big dark regions between very narrow, very small, very sharp bright spots like this. And when we have a surface that has many, many slits, we call it a diffraction grating, at least when we're talking about light passing through it. Now, diffraction gratings have many, many uses. Um, often, they have hundreds of slits, or in diffraction gratings, they're often not called slits, they're called lines, and there's hundreds of lines per millimeter. So we're talking about very, very small, or very, very closely packed lines or slits. And for a diffraction grating, we're not going to derive this, but the bright spots are given by n lambda is equal to d sine theta. n here is an integer, 0, 1, 2, 3, a non-negative integer. Lambda is the wavelength. d is the distance between adjacent slits. And then theta, I can draw the diagram here. Theta is this angle. It's the angle from or between a line going straight from the diffraction grating to the screen and a line to the point of interest on the screen. Uh, a diffraction grating is often characterized by the number of lines per millimeter or meter or centimeter or whatever. But you can relate that to the slit separation, lowercase d, by the number of lines per meter is equal to 1 over d where D is measured in meters. Now let's shift gears a little bit and talk about thin film interference. And we're going to start out by thinking about a soap bubble. So a soap bubble is really just a shell of thin soap film with air on the inside and air on the outside. And if we zoom in, it kind of looks like this. And if we zoom in really, really far into this, we can ignore the curvature of the bubble and we really just have a flat layer of soap with air on either side. And if we think about an incoming light wave, an incident wave like this, uh, well, some of it would probably reflect and some of it would be refracted. We will call this the transmitted part of the wave, this refracted part. It's transmitted because it continues on. And then it reaches this next boundary. And at that boundary, it can either reflect or refract, or reflect or transmit. Uh, and so we get this bouncing back and forth where at each boundary it could reflect or it could transmit. Now, when a light wave reflects off of a material with a higher index of refraction, it has a phase change of 180 degrees, or pi radians. If it has a phase change of 180 degrees, what that means is that the peaks of the wave become troughs now, and the troughs become peaks. The entire wave shifts 180 degrees of phase. So, let's think about that. I'm going to redraw this diagram with the soap film and the air, and we're going to think about an incoming wave. So, this part of the wave, or this reflected ray, it reflected off of a material with a higher index of refraction. So, this wave will have a 180 degree phase change, or a pi radian phase change. Now this one right here, this one did not ever bounce off of a higher index of refraction. So it does not have a phase change. But this one over here did travel farther than the other one. It traveled 2t farther than the other one, where t is the thickness of the soap layer. So there is a path difference between the two, and the path difference between these two waves is equal to 2t. Now you might argue, okay, well what about the angles? It's not actually 2t, it's some, uh, there's, you have to include the angle and figure out some kind of tri trigonometric thing. We're going to ignore that. Um, we're just going to say the path difference is 2t. Now, the conditions for destructive and constructive interference here are going to be a little bit different because of the phase change in one of the waves. So because of the phase change, because the peaks and the troughs have changed in this one wave, the conditions for constructive and destructive interference are now switched. 
To get constructive interference, the path difference has to equal n plus 1 half times lambda. And to get destructive interference, the path difference have to, has to equal n times lambda. Also, another complication is that the wavelength in the soap is going to be different. Because, remember, the frequency stays the same when you enter a new material, but the wavelength changes. So, because the wavelength in the soap is different, we have to add a correction for the path difference. And it turns out that the path difference corrected for this change of the wavelength in the new material, the path difference can be written as 2nt. So, for a thin film situation like this, there's constructive interference if n plus 1 half times lambda is equal to the path difference, which is equal to 2nt. Now, <laughs> there's two n's in this equation, and they're not the same thing. This n over here is a non-negative integer, 0, 1, 2, and so on and so on. This n over here is the index of refraction. Well, isn't that frustrating? So because of this, what we're going to do is we're going to take the n that represents the integers, we're going to call it m. So the condition for constructive interference is that m plus 1 half times lambda is equal to 2nt. And also, correspondingly, we could go through that argument and say that the destructive interference occurs if m lambda is equal to 2nt.